Good morning, Michelle and Kelly. Hope you're doing well. Mm -hmm. As you can see, we have another guest with us today. Joining us from Northern Wales, we have Sue Cox. Welcome, Sue. Thank you. Sue, I became aware of you because of a very excellent TED Talk you gave a few years back, uh, talking about leadership and followership and what one can learn from dance. And, in, and you were talking specifically about tango and how you can apply that to organizational thoughts around leadership and followership. And uh, if it's okay, Sue, so I'll put out the first question. I'd like to ask how you got started in dance. Yeah, um, actually what I got started in was, was drumming. I used to drum in a samba band. I was living in Liverpool, started drumming with a samba band and um, we used to gig. Um, and as you can imagine, a lot of the clubs that we would go and gig in would be Latin flavored, we'd be, we'd be the guest band on the Latin night. So I just used to, I was drumming away and I'd be watching all these people dancing who just looked so cool. And it just looked like great fun. And I'd never done any of it at all. Um, so I, I started learning. I, um, I managed to snag myself a boyfriend who was a really good dancer, which was great. And, and he taught me a lot. And so I started with salsa. Um, back in probably 93, 94, um, long before the kind of resurgence of, well, over here we call it Strictly Come Dancing. I think you have the same program by a different name over there, don't you? And With the stars, they call it in the US, yes. Yeah. Um, so way before that was kind of a gleam in a producer's eye, really. It was still quite a small underground scene. And I just, I, I always loved the music. And then I, I just fell in love with it. I fell in love with salsa first. Um, and I was thinking, I knew you were going to ask me something like this, and I was thinking, how, how did I start with tango? And I, I do not know to this day why I started dancing tango. I was, I was back at my mum's. I'd had some operation on my knee. I've had a lot of operations over the years on a, a, a troublesome knee. So I was not working. I was back at my mum's, and for some random... I don't know why, for some random reason, I saw this, um, I think it was Tango Passion. It was one of the touring tango shows that, you know, go around the world and it had Sexteto Mayor touring with them. I hadn't heard of any of this. And I just had this impulse that I was going to go on a train for a three or four hour journey to go and watch this event um, and persuaded a friend to come with me. And it blew my mind. I was just, first of all, the musicians, like, you know, it was back in the day, it was still the original lineup of um, Sexteto Mayor, and these little old elderly men kind of shuffled onto the stage, and I thought, gosh, these guys can barely walk. What is this going to be like? I've made a mistake. <laughs> I've really made a mistake here. And then, the, you know, there was that moment of silence, and they started playing, and the hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and it was, the music was electrifying, and then, of course, all of the dance, and... I just came out of it saying, wow, I, I, I want to know how to do that. That was extraordinary. Um, so that was it. And I, I lived in, um, well, for a while, I, I couldn't find any dance. I mean, tango was even more of a minority thing than, than salsa. And it was a couple of years before I moved to a part of the world where um, I managed to find, we had a tango teacher who would come up once a month from London, which was about a six hour trip away and, mm. and teachers once a month. Um, and that was how I got into it, really. Mm. Yeah. And that was still in 93, 94? Or was that a little bit later, Sue? That was probably quite a lot later, actually. Um, so the when I went to see the show was probably 97, 98, okay. something so like that. Really and I think you were doing salsa and having fun. Yeah. And was it a social yeah. level of dancing for you? Or did you compete? Or what did you do with your salsa just for fun? Social, totally, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and then, yeah, it was probably 1990, 2000 when, um, I mean, again, I was living in a quite a relatively rural um, area of the UK. It's not somewhere, you know, most people were, were outdoor sports. They would be runners or climbers or mountain bikers, stuff that I do myself as well. But um, yeah, dance was a minority interest, really. So um, sometimes those types of shows can just absolutely ignite passion that you didn't even know existed right and that's exactly 
I know what you mean with that sort of hair on the back of your neck and something where just everything comes together so electrifying, right? Whether it's the music and all of a sudden the feet and, and it's infectious in a beautiful way and you wanted to have a little bit of that and then here we are. So what happened after that, Sue? Um, what happened was quite a few years of having my once a month, maybe, you know, 10 times a year dance class. So I'd always get a bit embarrassed when people would say, oh, how long have you been dancing? You know, and I think <laughs> 10 years, <laughs> but actually 10 years of maybe 10 times a year is, is not that much, you know, so quite slow progress, really. Um, a very small pool of dancers. Um, and I, as you do when you, if you start dancing tango and you love it, there's just one place in the world where you really want to go. And um, for me, because as well, I was a climber and I, I loved the mountains. I wanted to go to Patagonia. I wanted to go to the big, the big outdoors of Argentina, but I also wanted to go to Buenos Aires. And it was, um, it, was a birth it was a big birthday present to myself when I turned 40. I thought, that's it. I'm taking some unpaid leave. I'm going to South America for six or seven weeks. I'm just going to go and, and have a bit of time in Buenos Aires and a bit of time in the mountains. Um, oh, good for you. I'm sure that was absolutely amazing. I'm excited to hear some details about that experience. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. And, it, and, and yes, ultimately life-changing because I came back thinking that's not enough. I need to spend more time in, in this place. Um, oh. it, it seeped into my soul, really. I, I always describe Buenos Aires as, as somewhere that, for me, wasn't an instant love. You know, it's not... Um, going to sound disparaging but it's not like Rome or like Paris or somewhere that I think is full of sites that or London that's things that you have to go and see you know it's just it's a city to live and working and and drink coffee and watch people and just it's the people and the culture and it just seeped into my soul and I I always say to people who said what is it why what was it the dance was it what what made you love it and I just I the only, the best answer that I have is I, I just felt more like me in that place than I've ever felt. It was just somewhere that, the, that I felt a kind of more vibrant, more colourful, more expressive version of who I am. It's who it enabled me to be. The really. ambiance of the place. Say again? The ambiance of the place. Yeah. Um, Hard to define. I just love it. I, I, it was the place, it was the right place for me to be at the right time. And so, and long story short, I went back to my job. I had um, a few conversations with them about, would it be possible to kind of keep my job and spend some of the time out there and um, some of the time in the job. And we were also restructuring and my role was going to disappear. And it just seemed a really good moment to say, do you know what? I, it's time to, it's time to close that chapter. Um, and and look at a new chapter and and right i'm going to leave the job i'm going to go and live in buenos aires for three months and dance my heart out for three months and oh, i love it that's so, fantastic yeah i'm really curious about that like what kind of had you already mentally set yourself like i'm gonna do this or were you full of like fear and unknown like what's where was how was that weighing on you what was happening the decision to 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 go and live out there for a bit you mean yeah 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 um, no, I was excited. I was ready. You know, there are times in life I think you're ready for a new chapter and it was definitely that moment in life for me. And I, hmm, I don't know if I'm reckless in that way, but it's not the first time I've quit a job in, <laughs> in quite sudden circumstances and just thought, I mean, it was actually quite considered in some ways. I've quit a job over the space of a weekend before just thinking, you know, something happened on a Friday that made me think, oh, that's not good. You know, if that's yeah. what this job is turning me into, that's not yeah. where I want to be. I'm, I'm, and, and I've traveled a lot. I've done a lot of independent traveling. So it wasn't unusual for me to, to go and travel somewhere on my own. I traveled around the, the Middle East and, and around a lot of Europe. I mean, Europe's easy for us to, to travel around. So, no, I was excited. And I, I was more nervous, if I'm honest, I was more nervous the first time I went out. And it wasn't the travel. It was the aspects of okay, I know I can travel on my own. I know I can go and, and be a tourist on my own, but I have no idea what it's like to, to go and dance on my own. I have no idea what it's like to turn up to a milonga in Buenos Aires without knowing anybody. And because I, I suppose the awkward thing about traveling, it's never the, 
going around and seeing places. It's when you want to go for a meal and sit in a restaurant or do all of those things that are kind of social occasions. So that's what I was nervous of. And I think I'd had that laid to rest in my first trip. Um, so I knew that was going to be okay. Right, so you could return back with this longer commitment and feel a lot more peace of mind with knowing what you wanted and, and how you would be fine on your own. Yeah, exactly yeah. that. Um, yeah, so I rented an apartment um, and, well, th three months became three years, basically. I just, I didn't come home. <laughs> um, oh, I love it. <laughs> Did you speak any Spanish uh, before you decided to return for the... Three months? No, no. Really, really a little bit. Um, yeah. Just noticing I'm shadowing my face there. I'll do it this side. Um, yeah, a small amount. I, I'd had learned, because I'd, I'd, I'd been to Cuba some years before, and I'd learned a bit of Spanish for that, um, and thought I would remember it, and then went out there and realized, no, I can't remember any of it. So I just, in the three months, it was about three or four months between when I come back at the end of the first trip, and I knew I went out, and I just did some home study. Um, but no, I, it was really basic. Well, I was wondering if, if your vocabulary was limited to just like a handful of tango terms. And and uh, <laughs> I, I think sometimes for dancers, right, we know certain dance terms, right? Cucaracha, which is, can be great, but it's quite another thing to go somewhere and figure out how to find an apartment and food and everything else you need to do yeah. to, especially if you're going to live there for three years. Yeah. Wow. That's well, yeah, it's funny. You are exactly right. I, so I had the basics. I could just about get by. But yeah, the first language I would, I was learning words like aflojar and estirar and, you know, relax and stretch and all things that are really dance words that are not great if you want to order a sandwich. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I wasn't working. I, my time was filled with, I would just go to like, as many classes as I could cram in. And then in the meantime, I'd sit in a cafe with my Spanish books and I had a little notebook and every time I every time I wanted to say something in Spanish and I didn't know how to say it I'd write it in English in my book and that would be my lesson for the next day I'd sit with my books and work out right how could I have said that and I, I guess I learned quite quickly really. Nice so I'm one of the things yeah. I'm kind of curious about that experience because clearly uh, Buenos Aires is a place a lot of tango enthusiasts do that pilgrimage. Yeah. Uh, how did so I've, I've been to Buenos Aires just for a very short stay, uh, embarrassingly short, like an afternoon, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was in Uruguay and I took the ferry across for a wonderful, well, it was a little bit more than afternoon, a wonderful day in Buenos Aires. Um, but I did, I was getting in a fair bit of tango in, in Uruguay on the, on the other side of the bay, I guess it is. Um, but how did you actually you so say you show up, how did you actually find places to take lessons and just participate in dance? Oh, that's a good question. And I, I, I'm struggling to remember now. Um, so there is, oh, and I can't remember the name of, there's a cultural center in the, in the heart of town, which um, offers a lot of classes. So that's an easy place to start. Um, if you go into milongas, there are there's all the tango magazines and the shoe shops that have lots of information about classes and milongas and teachers. And of course, I happen to go to a few of the shoe shops occasionally, <laughs> um, just just a few. Um, and then I was really lucky. I th through family connections, there was a I met somebody out there who just became a cornerstone of of my social world out there um, Manuel if you're listening hello and thank you um, he just he took me under his wing really and so he would he took me to Milongas and he introduced me to lots of people and the folks who became my social network um, so I was I was just I think of it as a time where I was just blessed it's like somebody sprinkled magic dust over those three years and it was just the, the most perfect um, moment in time in terms of the people and the the things that I got to do. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Wow. Okay. Let's talk about uh, the incredible wealth of, of knowledge of learning how to dance there. You know, did you, was that, yeah, I, I just want to hear more about that experience in, in your partnership and the Malongas and just a little bit, maybe a few examples, Sue, of, of what that was like. 
Ooh, um, wonderful and frustrating and dispiriting. <laughs> and, you know, I think, I mean, if you, you've watched the TED Talk, I know, so I talk about a little bit about this in the TED Talk of, I went out there, I suppose, quite confident, thinking in my little world, in my little fish pond where I lived, I was quite a good dancer. And um, I think it took me most of that first three months to realise oh, I'm really not actually very good at this. I was, I was so not good at it that I didn't know how not good at it I was in lots of ways. And um, yeah, would turn up thinking, it's hard to gauge your, your level. You know, I thought I'm not a beginner. Am I intermediate? Am I advanced? Let's go and test some of these classes out. And um, yeah, a slow realization that I'm not getting this. I'm, there's something different in the way that I'm moving or I'm not getting it. And um, so, you know, it's almost like the stock answer should be, it was amazing and it was fantastic, but actually it's not, it is tricky to find the right teacher for you at whatever moment you are, I think, in your dance progression. Um, oh my goodness, and that applies to any genre. Yeah. And in particular, it's also a very humbling experience to have a little bit of that preset, like you were saying, like you think, well, I'm relatively good at this. And then to be put in an environment and exposed to different levels that sort of let you revisit that and figure out where am I? Or it doesn't really matter where you are, but where do you think you are and where do you want to go? So that probably changed your journey. Mm. And, and when you realize that, can you find the people who can help you with that where you are and where you want to go as well and, and convey it in a way that makes sense to you? And, and I certainly look back and think there are a lot of classes that I went to that I think I just wasn't ready for that, yeah. that teacher or that class at that moment. Um, and I think in the early stages probably went away going, oh, that's not a very good class. <laughs> you know, that's yeah, not right. a very good teacher. Whereas actually I just wasn't, I wasn't the right thing for me in that point in time where it wasn't um, offering what I needed, um, what I was ready for. I love that you just said that, Sue, because as, as much as I completely am excited and know this is a tango-based conversation and experience for you, that in itself is very important to acknowledge just in life and in other dances, right? Mm. Just because you, sometimes it's finding the right teacher and the right experience to share, and sometimes it's also recognizing where you are and the content may not necessarily fit yet. It, it mm. could be premature. It could be anything it, you know you're just not there and we see that all the time here at our studio that you know when you reintroduce something or expose yourself to something in six months or three months later the reception is totally different because you've grown and you're in a different place and i'm sure that that happened weekly for you in that exposure and just culturally and different teachers and different malangas constantly being saturated with newness right mm. yeah Absolutely. Um, and I remember one moment coming out of a, it had been a, a kind of stretching for dancers class that I'd gone to and we'd been doing some work on a bar and, um, you know, and I didn't have great flexibility, but I went for a coffee with, uh, he was an American guy that was in the class as well. And we just said, hey, let's go for a coffee. And he we was walking along and he said, I oh, you know it's really clear to me that you don't use your core. And <laughs> I don't even know what you mean. What do you mean? Use my core. <laughs> I have no concept of what that is. And that's kind of where, you know, to gauge my level. <laughs> and, and just that kind of, that's where I was. And that basic level of, of so far away from the understanding, I think. And it was one of the things, and then we'll probably talk a little bit later about the leadership work that I've mm -hmm. developed, but um, the, the kind of working title that I had for, for some of the work when I was trying to feel my way into it was that it's not about the steps. And I think one of the ways that we get, or certainly I had been taught, or i not even been taught, but what I had brought to it myself was this sense of just, and what I even probably find when you teach people is they want lots of figures, they want lots of steps, teach us this new thing, teach us how to do a gancho, teach us how to do a, a hero, or, um, and just, coming into the space where I was able to start seeing I can have all those steps and I can follow all those sequences but that's not what the dance that's not dance yeah. you know anybody can follow those steps but they it doesn't look like dance and it doesn't feel like 
dance and I, I think it was that question was probably my starting point of thinking well how come when I do this and I know this stuff but it doesn't look or feel like what I see other people doing on the floor yes. and it doesn't have that that beautiful something hmm. you know? That's, uh, I think this is great talking about the transition from that moment into now looking at it more completely. Uh, I think that's a great segue of, of what then was the next, like, how did that continue to transition, not only for a better understanding for you, but now into your leadership stuff? How did this turn into, okay, I want to share this in business, or I want to share this with other people so they understand, like, what was that process like? Hmm. Um evolving again there was no sudden moment I don't think I mean my work um you know I don't work in in dance I work in learning and development and management and leadership development anyway so I was already immersed in that whole field of leadership and how to help leaders in the, in the reality of their day-to-day -day business um so I think it's a it it felt like a, a kind of natural coming together of two two worlds really is I, 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 I suppose there was something for me about stepping more fully into what it means to be a follower in, in dance and th this kind of revelation, slow, not a bang revelation, but this slow realization of, Oh, you mean I have to show up and take an active part in this? <laughs> you know, that I'm, I'm not just a kind of somebody who gets moved around the floor by the leader making all the decisions. And, and this, that whole part of my learning, part of my unlearning, I suppose, and relearning out in Buenos Aires was that part of what it, what it means to show up as a follower in, in, in tango and kind of take your space in that. I mean, I love that you, you talk about partner dancing. And it's exactly that when we think about the word partnership well what it, what does partnership mean you know and it isn't this um controlling especially the image of tango argentine tango where you have the big macho man and yeah. that whole and this idea that the woman is getting directed around by this macho man um whereas actually the reality of what's going on underneath is so so very different from that and it is that and I don't, I have really limited experience of other dances. It's really just salsa and, and tango for me. So I, but my guess is it's, it's true in most dances that it is, it is partnership. It's partner dancing and it's a great word for it um, because yeah, that's also both really active. Yeah, no, I like that you, you mentioned that because it is important. It has this tag of being, you know, dominant in a sense, right? Of tango. Traditionally, people interpret that as, you know, here's the man and the woman is relatively submissive and in the sense of just complying and going along through the ride. But it doesn't exist without partnership. And mm -hmm. that is such a beautiful thing because there's this conversation that happens very intrinsically with tango that is very interesting compared to other it happens in all dances but in this conversation of tango it is this wonderful exchange back and forth between what is offered and suggested and what is followed and that's the improvisational side that is very intriguing about tango which i'm sure you would maybe one of the reasons you love it it just gives you a little bit of creativity and freedom well, and it's one, it is that, and it's beautifully put because it's that dialogue relational space that is, is um, wraps back to Kelly's question about where did I start to bring the two together really. Um, and it is one of the reasons I love it, but it was also the one of the reasons that I found really, it really difficult and frustrating at first because you, you have to, it is a paradigm shift. It's a mindset yeah. shift, isn't it? To, yeah. to come into that space of saying, oh, oh, this is a kind of collaborative, co-creative, piece I don't it, it's the step between you know showing up as a follower that says I, I really want to dance with you lead me around the floor then you know to no I I really want to dance with you and I'm right in here co-creating it with you um and that as I say I'm, my experience is limited and, and I'm, in salsa certainly it's not that um I mean I love you know the craft in learning to follow in salsa um but it's, it's an altogether different kind of exactly dialogue in, in tango. And of course, not everybody dances tango in, yeah. in that kind of dialogic relational way, but that's, that's where the most beautiful dance is for me. Um, 
I, a... I do agree. I think there is that that paradigm shift in in dancing in general, and uh, I I. I wish there was a, maybe a better word uh, than leadership. I think a lot of people come into dance and they, they just have the wrong idea in their mind, right? That mm -hmm. it's, it's the traditionally the man's role, but whoever's in the leadership role is taking care of everything. And the other, as Michelle, as you were saying, the other person's just along for the ride. Mm -hmm. And so you get this idea of just muscling this person around the floor, which is not a very enjoyable experience for either person. <laughs> If that's what you're doing, right? And suddenly, but when you, um, when you're able to transition to this other phase, uh, it really becomes so much more enjoyable, mm -hmm. and and there's room for play, uh, there's um, room for just so much more. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a we had an episode earlier this year, uh, quite early in the year, I think it was episode four where we had a fellow, Jeff Fox was his name, and he talked about what, they, what he called liquid lead dancing. And, um, and they had this concept of actually uh, quite literally transferring the leadership role between the two partners as you dance. And, and they, they were doing that for different types of dances and it became a, a very much a negotiation. Like, okay, I'm in a sense, I'm out of ideas, uh, you know, and there's a transition point. Do you want to lead without actually saying that, right? Mm -hmm. And the person says, yeah, I've got some ideas or no, continue, right? And it's, it seems like it was such an, an interesting idea there. And it was something that I think in, in his case came out of the world of same sex mm -hmm. uh, dancing. But um, even in, in heterosexual uh, environments. I think it's really so cool that even if you're maintaining a leader role and a follower role, that you do have that dialogue. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I, that's one of the reasons why I found your, your talk. And we will definitely put the link to your talk in our show notes. Uh, mm -hmm. But why I found it so inspiring. Um, it, it, it just really resonated with me. Oh, thank you. Um... Yeah, and I love, I love what you say about the word, you know, I wish we had a better word for it, because I totally, you know, leadership is, bless it, it's, it's, we load so much onto that word, in terms of what we, what the range of different kind of situations that we expect it to be adequate for, and it's no surprise to me that we end up in a muddle, really, and... It um, creates a lot of stress, to be honest, as a, as a teacher, uh, I think men often feel the weight of the responsibility of having to decide and know and give you enough information as a follow. And I think follows, I'm so glad we're talking about this all around, Sue, because there is a responsibility to followership and there needs to be a little bit more conversation about, you know, you are bringing the other half of this conversation and this partnership and it only works well when we're working together and that is getting highlighted in this awesome little interview with you and uh, it's important for ladies not to come in and just sort of do the whole move me around the floor just dance me and that that doesn't work because that doesn't allow you to be a good recipient you're not receiving the information properly you're not responding and i feel like you know i want all of my ladies to excuse me, listen to this so that they can change their receptors, right? Yeah. Think about what you're bringing to the dance floor as well. Yeah. And for a guy, you know, I imagine that's just really boring. You must have the same dance with every woman. If you're not, if somebody isn't up there co-creating with you, right. in a sense, it's, I think, you know, in the dance world, I think that was one of my learnings. It's like, gosh, if I don't step up, then, um, you're putting all the responsibility for the dance onto the, the leader in inverted commas, you know, and, and so not only are they having to carry all that responsibility you just talked about, Michelle, but they're, they're, they've got the responsibility for creating what the next step's going to be and then the floor craft and where the, just all of it. So if somebody's carrying all of that, you can, it's not hard to imagine how much that restricts what's possible 
in terms of what's going on in the dance. And then to come back to your question, Kelly, where's the, you know, you start talking about those kind of things in the dance and it's quite clear how you start to get those kind of metaphors and how it starts to transfer into, well, that I could have that conversation in a, in any of the boardrooms that I sit in or with any of the leadership teams yeah. that I sit in around, you know, when people come and say, I, could you just, I, you know, can you, get my people so I don't, my people so I don't have to micromanage them or um, yeah. you know or yeah. how can I engage my team more and you start listening so the language is already there in terms of leadership and followership and I also I'm going to get carried away here there's so many little things in this so first of all the shift from leader even when you shift from leader and follower to leadership and followership that becomes slightly subtly different for starters because it's not a quality of the person anymore it's a quality of an action Mm. which can be fluid and I watched that that liquid lead talk I thought it was beautiful because you are talking about then it becomes an action that anybody can take step up into that leadership space as opposed to I'm the leader you know and I'm the follower it's a it's it is more fluid um but even then further in in the Spanish I don't think I've ever heard any teacher anywhere use the word leader talk about leading um instead there's much more and so, again, and I, and I talk about this slightly, I think, in the TED Talk about if we could find words that were less loaded in terms of their power mm. relationships, what, what would that open up for us in the way we think about this and the way we approach it? And, and yeah, I'm thinking through the, all of the tango teachers in Spanish, uh, they would use phrases like open it's talking about opening up a space or invite or marcar which is just kind of indicate or suggest and that's a much more equal kind of relational you know you you open a space but it's entirely up to your partner to decide do they move into it do they move into it this way do they move into it that way so then you it's a very different dialogic space or way of dancing and i Again, I wish we had a language in, in the business world that was not so loaded as leader, leader and follower, or even leadership. I prefer leadership and followership, but it still gets us in this space of where we're kind of one person acting upon another. We're two independent actors. Yeah. And actually, what I suppose what I began to experience in the dance was it's it's that space of connection where actually it's not about you or me, whatever I call you, whether you're a leader or a follower or a man or a woman. Um, I mean, and in Spanish, they would often say, you know, it's the man does this and the woman does this, which is great if you're dancing in a um, heterosexual environment, but it becomes problematic in other spaces. But if we had a language that just recognized these are different but equal roles, that they didn't have this power built into them, and if we could move that into a business world, for example, and started, it would move us away from those, we need to engage our people, which is something that you hear quite a lot of. And if you listen to that, well, there's a, there's a power thing in there, isn't it? There's somebody who will be, do the engaging and somebody who will be engaged. Right. Um, so somebody will act and somebody who will be acted upon. And just trying to unpick that and say, well, what if we thought of that differently? What if we decided that these were people who actually we're quite capable of being engaged themselves and what we need to do is stop doing the stuff that gets in the way of them bringing their fully engaged self to the dance as it were and and so it's those kind of questions that that really interest me and I think that the the dance was I felt it I'd, I'd never felt it so strongly so I you know I've been immersed in loads of leadership theory and and some of it's great a lot of it is not so great a lot of it I would equate to the learn the steps process of tango. So, you know, great leaders are this or great leaders do this. And here are the 12 steps to being a great leader, which is much the same as here are the 12 steps to dancing tango. You can know the steps, but it won't turn you into a dancer, you know, and you can know the, the kind of mechanics of what great leaders are supposed to do. But does that mean you'll go out and be a great leader? Mm, you know, I don't think the shelves would be so full of bookshelf, uh, the, you know years and years of books if it was that simple so there's something about that that journey of where is the heart of this and coming back to the idea it's actually it's in that relational space it's it's kind of leadership as a relationship leadership as 
dialogue, leadership as a partnership, and I'm particularly interested in um, those areas of leadership where we really are, where what we currently think we know about leadership or what we do know about leadership doesn't serve us. So all the the biggest kind of world crises that are just complex and difficult and thorny and and the the word that gets used a lot in business now is um, VUCA. I don't know if you've come across that. It stands for volatile and uncertain, complex and ambiguous. Oh, and that's, <laughs> it's a loaded definition. It's really, <laughs> but you think about, I mean, I don't want to get overly political in this, but you think about anything, you know, whether it's the NHS in the UK or the refugee crisis or the environment or any of the big problems that we are kind of existentially anxious about and can't get to grips with and don't know how to solve. They're all of those things. They're, right. they're really complex. They're affected by actions halfway around the world that we know nothing of. They're, they're not, we can't control this. You know, it's a fallacy to think that we can, some leader is gonna step in and manage this crisis. Right. And that to me is, this, is a slight kind of, it's a parallel to that. What do we load on a leader in the dance if we just kind of say, what's me around the floor then? You know, and we, we hit these problems and we wait for some heroic leader to come in and solve it for us. And it, they're too big, they're too messy, they're too complicated. It's never going to happen. So we need to become more, I suppose what I'm trying to do with the, the tango is, is speak something into that question of saying, how do we get more skilled? at bringing leadership in to those emergent uncertain spaces where we're never going to know everything we need to know, where we can't control, we can't begin to get close enough to control all the, bar the variables in there, but we still need to find a way through it. And I, that sounds massive. I'm kind of aware of how grand that sounds, but in a sense of when I bring that down to that thing that you were talking about, um, of that co-creation piece, particularly in Tango where you know, I, I always say that the, the dance isn't the step. The dance happens in the moments of stillness between the steps. Because, you know, when you're making the step, then you're already in action, aren't you? But it's those moments when we're in that space and no, neither of us quite know what the next step is going to be. And yet the next step happens. The next step does emerge and the dance carries on. And it goes from kind of that moment of stillness and decision, we flow through the step. And then the next moment of stillness and decision and we flow through the steps so what is it in those moments then how what is it that we're doing to create the dance in that moment because we're not following a sequence not in tango we're we're kind of making it up so that fascinates me and that's what i wanted to when i when i pulled the ballroom to the boardroom piece together it was i know i experienced that on the dance floor and i know other dancers experience that and it is so powerful how can I try and bring that to people who don't dance? Because I can write about it and I can try and capture it in words, but A, you know, I'm not, much as I would love to say I'm the first person who's come up with this kind of metaphor of leadership and tango and leadership and dance, I, I haven't, you know, sadly. There's, there's writing about it, there's lots of stuff out there, but it's, I wanted people to experience it. I wanted people to kind of feel it with that, that full, felt sense that I get when I'm on the dance floor and I think other dancers do. So how to bring it to life in a way that wasn't talking about it, but was, come on, I want to run a session with you so you can really feel this. I'm not sure if I've answered your question, Kelly. I've gone all over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. The problem is that the, more, the more you talk and the more you develop this, the more I have 80 more questions and then you answer them as you're talking. So it's like <laughs> every time I think of a question, I just wait a couple sentences and you've answered it. So I'm just like, I'm just on this magical tour bus and I'm just absolutely loving it. I will say I really love the idea of the, of the changing the verbiage because you're right, leader or leadership or follower followership is really loaded. And I think here mm -hmm. in America, with identifying as different things, there's really been a, a movement of getting out of saying man and woman, right? Getting to, so leader and follow was, a, was an acceptable vernacular. But at the same time, I think you're right. I think if we can transcend that because we're all getting used to changing our language anyway, right now is a good time to strike on that of being like, well, let's change it again. So it doesn't put us in a box, so to speak. And uh, I, I guess what I'm wondering is how is this, 
How was the reception of that? Like for you, it said the progress wasn't immediate. It was a slow growth over time as you learned more. But yet when you're, when you're dealing with business, right? And, and businesses and companies and bosses and whatnot, you have a, a very limited window to achieve your goals. So it's, how is that happening? How have you met a lot of resistance? Have you, you know what I mean? What kind of tricks have you develop to get that to happen in a short amount of time? Does that make sense? Mm. <laughs> yeah, and it's um, so sort of different ways of answering that. I think once I have people in a room, I think it, it, the, the process that I've developed to take people through, I think it lands. I mean, I, I would love, you know, sometimes if people say, can you do this in an hour? And, and I can do something in an hour that's a kind of short, that's more like a fun experience session. If I want to get into that depth, then it needs more time. So there's always the challenge of, are people willing and ready to kind of invest that amount of time into something that is a little bit left field for a lot of people? And, and at the same time, I think it's, it's strange that it's left field because my whole background in this was originally experiential learning um and we've got a really well established tradition over there and over here of, of taking people into the great outdoors to do kind of leadership development and personal development um and so i would see that you know dance or any kind of arts as as again it's just another form of experience if it's valid to take people rock climbing i expect them to learn something about themselves and how they relate to challenge and how they relate to other people and we kind of accept that well dance is another form of experiential learning really but it does seem to be less commonly accepted on the whole um so that it's kind of the first trick is always getting people through the door i think is, is the um and particularly for executives or people who think they're utterly dance phobic or have two left feet or um and yet people that i have persuaded to come who have just said oh, i'm so not a dancer i yeah. Ooh, not for me no, it's just well it's not about dance you know I'm not trying to teach you to dance I'm using it as a way of opening up some exploration around leadership um, and thinking about how how we approach leadership um, so how is the reception I, I think Kelly maybe had mentioned yeah. that but it's there are so many wonderful tangents and they're all valid so yeah I and I will follow them <laughs> but what what was the reception I mean that resistance is quite common in all realities, right? People, you know, if you don't feel confident at something, you don't usually want to go there, particularly men, we have the egos to contend with. So when you're in an environment like that, where you have, you know, established men in a very big corporate sort of mentality and world, and you're bringing them into this concept that has this dance connection, it, there's lots of resistance. But yet there's always this wonderful transition that once they get it and are exposed to it, there is this warm welcome. So mm -hmm. did you feel like you would get that reception in your capacity of trying to share this leadership yeah. followership? I think probably the reality for that, Michelle, is I probably haven't yet had found a way of getting into the most resistant places. I think the way I've been able to offer it um, so far has generally been um, there's, there's probably people who have come have probably had more buy-in to begin with. I don't think I've been in a situation where I've been um, fully facing some of that resist of people being told you will go on this session, you Absolutely. know, and you, you will do this. So, um, so I've, uh, I've spoken at a lot of events. I would go to a lot of conferences um, I've gone into some, probably less in the business world, um, more in educational sectors and um, yeah, so I, I'm not sure. I think it's kind of a challenge of, I mean, it's on hold at the moment because of COVID and, and, and other reasons anyway, I'm just not able to be out there doing it because it's such a, it's, it's not distance, is it? When you, if you want to get people to do this dance. Um, yeah. So I, I would say it's just a really, it's a good challenge. Um, 
I've certainly had a couple of conversations with people who are saying, you know, I love this session. People from an HR world who said, I absolutely love this. I would love to get this in front of my executive board. I'm not quite sure how I would sell it to mm. them. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's a piece of work for me to do there about how I, how I, how do I present that in a way that would kind of circumvent some of the barriers that might get put up. Um, and I, I mean, coming back to the reception, I suppose my exam, my experience of it is more on an individual basis of when I have said to people, look, just come and see, you don't, if you don't like it, you can leave. <laughs> it's fine. Come along. And they have, um, and those instances, I, I, I tend to get a mix. I get a, a lot of women uh, who are there because they love Strictly Come Dancing or, or Dancing with the Stars in your, and they just kind of think they're going to get the chance to do some of that tango stuff. Um, and then um, just love, just want to dance. Or some people who I've persuaded to come along who are really phobic or some people who volunteer to come along because they are uh, coming from a place of going, do you know what? This is the thing that I most, that I least want to do. And because it's the thing that I least want to do, I should do it. And I should come along and be open to the experience. Um, and they, I would say without exception, they come away going, wow, that's, that's, that wasn't my, is it what I expected. No. So, um, I'm not sure if that deals with your question. I, I, think, I think there is a little bit of, I just haven't, um, it's quite early days with me taking it out into the world and getting into that space. In, in terms of working with where you might expect to see some more of that resistance. Mm -hmm. David, I feel like you've been wanting to say yeah. something for a while, hop in no, there. There's so much great discussion going on. So I'm, much. I'm loving it. I'm, so there is a couple thoughts going through my mind. One, uh, first of all, I, I, I love the parallel because you were talking earlier, Sue, about how there's so many very large problems in the world where you can't predict everything you're going to have to deal with and and there is that reality on the dance floor you if you're dancing with someone new you're not going to really know what it's like to lead with that person or follow that individual uh you before you actually start dancing you're not going to know what their skill level is you might not be familiar with the music right yeah. uh yeah. that particular music and so you're always adapting to the music you don't going to know what's happening on the dance floor around you as, as people are coming into your your space or you're planning to move in this direction and suddenly your your, your plan is foiled. I, I, I shared uh, earlier uh, in a different podcast how in my earlier days of dancing I hated any dance that traveled because I had such a hard time dealing with that until I, I got to a, a proficiency where I suddenly found that that was one of the most enjoyable aspects of dancing. But um, you, you, you talked about there is this need for, in a sense, the, the follower to be able to step up, right, to play an active role. And as you were saying that, I think that for that to work, the, the leader also has to step up in a way too to be receptive to that right so you have as a leader you have to be able to transition from hey i've got this plan come along for the ride i'm gonna you know in in the worst case like just muscle you through my plan right and if you're going to offer an alternative i also need to be able to have my sensors on and my receptors on to be able to receive your input to perhaps do something with that and so if i'm a very authoritative leader, then that's really going to limit the possibilities, I suspect, as well. So I, I don't know if you have anything to say about that. I did have one other thing I'll, I'll spit out and then I'm going to shut up for a little while. Um, I'm, I was just wondering in my mind if people who are perhaps very good and they've mastered that in dancing, if it if they take that skill naturally into mm. other aspects of their life, so into, into the workplace, for example, mm -hmm. or if it even occurs to them, right? So just, you know, it might be that people uh, learn this skill over here, but without actually having it exposed to them in the way you, you've done in your TED talk, for example, mm -hmm. uh, that they might, it might not even occur to them, perhaps, 
uh, to behave in that very same way in the boardroom or in the workplace. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. That's a great thought. I mean, we, we, we do compartmentalize, don't we? I think as a, as a species, we kind of operate in one way in this environment and we don't always make the, translate that into the different spaces of our lives. Um, and I suppose my thoughts are, I mean, and not just speaking from the tango point of view, but from as an experiential educator in a way for, for 30 years, I, I don't, I think some people do that um, instinctively, but, but a lot of us don't, you know, if we were, if we were great at doing that kind of reflection and putting things into practice, we wouldn't keep having the same arguments with our partners or, you know, getting into trouble in school or just that kind of reflection. Reflection leading to change behavior is not always a, a smooth process. And, and that's why people like myself, I suppose, operate in, out there in terms of actually behavior change is, is tricky for most people. We can think about it and we can know what we should do or know what we'd like to do, but actually to make that jump is, is quite hard. Um, oh, this is a whole other podcast. This is just such a yeah. topic. <laughs> it's true, but I think the trigger that got me in that little um, last run there, Sue, was the car, uh, sorry, compartmentalizing. It is so true. So even on the dance floor, when people walk into the studio or you go to an event or you go to a party, there's a mindset that you take with you about that particular experience and what that's going to be for you. Mm -hmm. And when you're done and you leave, you leave that role. And that's what we're trying to talk about, this beautiful crossover where we could maybe take some of those principles and share them in a much healthier way so that they just develop a little bit more exchange and partnership without such strict black and white lines, right? There needs to be the respect of what the roles provide but this wonderful melding together of how we can bring those in a higher level, whether it's in the boardroom, whether it's in a relationship, whether it's on the dance floor, it's so important for all of these things to have the same concept. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, like I said, Kelly's laughing at me, but this is like, and no. dance is an example. <laughs> yeah. is an example, dance is an example, but all of those things are so critical and, uh, David, you do a lot of social dancing. Kelly and I both teach and have uh, students and these conversations are everywhere, right? Just this whole, yeah, yeah we have yeah, you know students that come in and that concept, that very old concept of this is my job, this is your job, this is my role, I'm the leader, I get to say what we do and when we do it. And it's just like, okay, hold on, we need to back this up and we need to have some new conversations. And it needs to change. And maybe like you said about like the verbiage and just maybe the titles of things are getting a bit antiquated and there needs to be new interpretations of what we're doing so that we can make it even better. Yeah. And for me, anything that kind of helps us step into that space, where we're asking those questions, whether it's dance or, you know, there are people who do it through music, I think, and the way that you manage an orchestra or just anything that can bring it to life for people in that felt sense way is is so important um and i think it i mean i i think it's changed me you know and i think of the the teachers some of the teachers i've had who say you know tango is life tango is life life is tango and it does i think when you're immersed in it it does seep into every other area of your life it becomes part of who you are um i don't know if there's a i mean it's a great i i I haven't thought about it deeply as a question, but is there a point along where you start from somebody who just dips into it every now and then because you like it to where you are immersed in it, that it's, as you move towards that immersion stage, does it start to seep and leak into other, into your life more fully? I, I guess that would be my experience. And if I think of some of my teachers who just, it, it feels like it has become their identity. It's so much a part of who they are that it couldn't not be showing up in other areas i think when it seeps in your soul which is always sticking to me i love the way you said that earlier sue um, when you do that that is where you have those quiet conversations that you said that the exchange and the conversation is when you're 
between steps. Mm -hmm. And that is when it is so become you that you can feel and share that. And I have the pleasure of saying, I have that conversation with David when I dance with David, because there is just this quiet calm that I can share with him that is so sweet. And you don't have that with every partner. You don't have that with every person that you dance with. You certainly don't have it in a tutorial teaching level all the time because you're working on educating people. But that little space that just soothes your soul is exactly unique and it's part of something that just takes over it's way beyond the step mm -hmm. yes that was a compliment to you david thank you <laughs> i have to say I, I i feel very much the same about you sue uh you know it's interesting when when we started this this talk i was feeling rather good about myself as a dancer because I, oh, oh. Really, really, really. <laughs> we know this and clearly you know we are as, as dancers, dance, dancers must be so much more effective in the workplace because they've developed this skill. And then that, that's, that was why I asked that earlier question, because perhaps not, because it's very likely that I've never even personally made that linkage, right? Well, I might do that on the dance floor. I'm just not in that frame of thought. So uh, when, I'm, when I'm in the workplace. I, for that reason, I want to thank you, certainly, for bringing this, even to dancers, right, this concept of the relationship between things like dance and leadership and followership in uh, workplace settings and uh, having us think about that. I think, it, I think it's a very powerful uh, metaphor mm -hmm. and um, you, you brought it to light and communicated it so effectively. So thank you for that. So Sue, if people wanted to reach out to you and they have, if they have questions and so forth, what's the best way for them to do that? Sure. Um, well, so the TED talk is there and I believe you're gonna post a link to that, thank you. Definitely. The other way would be just a direct email, um, which is the, the, the business email is ballroom uh, number two, boardroom at gmail.com ballroom to boardroom at gmail.com. Yeah. Excellent. Sue, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. It was so nice to meet you. Yes, that was lovely, Sue. Great conversations. Thank you so much for everything. That was a wonderful way to spend the day. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's been an absolute delight and a, and a real privilege to get to talk about it for, for that amount of time to people who want to listen. <laughs> so thank you.